recording. Welcome, everybody. Okay. Oh, hold, hold on a sec. Um, so, uh, welcome to the third and final groundwork webinar, which is Introduction to Tractor and Machine Safety. I'm Beth Holtzman, and I'm coordinating the groundwork project along with Susie Hodgson. Our presenter is Shane LeBrake, um, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Shane. Very good. Thank you. And welcome to everybody on this Wednesday morning. So today we are talking about the introduction to tractor and machinery safety. And the original idea here is that it's not just you we're talking about, but also the people who work for you and how you think about preparing them as well as yourself for using tractors and machinery. So we're going to cover a lot of ground as usual. Um, I tend to pack a lot into my talk, so we're going to get started right away. Here we go. Uh, whoops. I wasn't expecting that one. There's our all of our sponsorship, our obligatory slide to let everybody know who is helping us with this. And more. And here we go. So uh, years ago when I first started farming, our, I worked for a farmer in Apulia, New York, which is outside of Syracuse, Bill Casey. And he always said a farmer should always have three things, a bandana, a knife, and a watch. And uh, I think those are really key things to carry with you in the work that we do. And it, it tends to lead to what I think is um, being prepared for the work, showing up prepared for the work. And of course, I've added there a Sharpie marker and a cell phone. Back in those days, cell phones were just coming onto the scene. So we didn't really think about that much. And of course, it oftentimes makes a watch redundant. But what I'm really trying to encourage with this notion is that if we are going to think about safety on our farms, um, we need to model good safe work habits every day when we're out there with our crews, with our staff, with our apprentices, whatever word we are using to describe the people who work for us, apprentices, trainees, workers, interns. They're looking up to us as to how they should conduct themselves in our chosen field of work. And so we need to model that. And so what I want to just encourage here is that as a way of thinking about safety, it starts with how we prepare for the work. And that includes how we dress, you know, steel toe boots. If we're working with equipment and machinery, certainly the sandals come off, the soft toed sneakers come off, uh, anything that would have a slippery sole comes off. And we really need to think about this. This is something we should be investing in as part of our expense uh, of doing the work, part of how we think of uh, what it costs us to do the work. Um, I'm a real big advocate for wearing steel toe boots around machinery. Steel hurts. And then there's whole, all the personal protective equipment we should be considering. So definitely hearing protection, eye protection when needed. Some jobs that we do throw a lot of material up into our faces or around us, and we want to protect our eyes as well as uh, our lungs. Um, there's just a tremendous amount of dust and uh, other contaminants that we're exposed to in our work. I'm going to come back to this later because there's actually sources for getting some of this material um, through NICAM at a reduced cost. Hopefully, as you're developing your uh, career in farming, you're developing a library of books. Um, these are some titles that I've been able to find on the topic of farm safety. Um, the book on the left, Agricultural Safety, is actually part of an entire series that John Deere put out called Fundamentals of Machinery Operation. And I found that on Amazon. Uh, a lot of those books were once part of school BOAG programs, and they're out there. So you can search for that. Uh, the other two in the lower right might be difficult to find. Unfortunately, the Motor Books Country Workshop series that put out the Farm Safety Handbook, the one that's furthest on the right, that is no longer in print. Um, I have been able to find them on searches, so it is out there. And the other book pictured, the Farm Rescue Book, um, sadly, that whole series, which was out of the um, NRAs, the National, um, what is it, Natural Resource Ag Education Service, I think, or Ag Extension Service. It was out of Cornell. It was a collaborative with all the other land grants in the Northeast. They had a wonderful series of books back in the 90s that are no longer in print, unfortunately. But I want to just encourage the point that uh, we should be having a, uh, resources available to our workers and our trainees, and for ourselves, of course. 
And then tractor manuals and equipment manuals are extremely important. And, and I uh, made a point when I was running the ecosystem farm here in Akakeek for 12 years, every year when we had new apprentices come in, part of our training was a day-long training on tractors and machinery. And all of them were given the assignment of taking home the tractor manuals and reading them. And then to be sure that they read them, the next day when they came in for work, I would give them paid time to sit up on the tractor and reread the manual and have it right there with them as they went and familiarize themselves with all of the topics covered in the manual. Now that can be a tedious little process, but I really believe if we're going to put these um, new entry people onto machinery that they've never experienced before, it's really important for them to get some awareness of what we're talking about. Uh, most of us somewhere on our farms have a farm shop or a shed where we keep all of our equipment uh, that we do our maintenance with. And um, this is obviously uh, photographs. These are taken of the same farm shop. This is a job I was asked to do a few years ago to come in and clean this up and inventory it. It was quite a job. Um, unfortunately, this was not how the owner left it. He had passed away and others had kind of moved in and just uh, paid no respect for what had been once uh, established protocol there. And you can see looking around here, there are just all kinds of tripping hazards, uh, biohazards. There's spilled liquids on the floor. You have batteries stored uh, actually just feet away from a wood stove. You can't see the wood stove in the lower right-hand photograph, but it's just to the side of where you see that hatchet on the concrete. You can just see a glimpse of it in the lower corner of the photograph. But obviously, a lot of potential hazards here, both falling hazards and safety hazards. And uh, after a few days there, we were able to clean that shop up and get it looking like this. All of the uh, pathways are clear. You have a clear workspace where you can bring a machine in and work on it. Um, and there's nothing there to trip over, to fall over. That's the ideal. And that's the kind of things we want to create for our, our staff on our farms and for ourselves ideally. Um, I am a real believer that everything is in its place all the time and every time. I don't want to go searching for things that's lost time, lost productivity, um, and just you know one more distraction in an already busy day. And that comes back to safety. Another safety issue on our farms that's been addressed with this innovation, the quick hitch or quick attach systems. Uh, the three-point hitch is one of the danger points that many farmers and their workers experience because it's not uncommon for a farmer to sit in the seat of the tractor or have one of his workers or her workers or trainees sitting in the seat of the tractor and then backing up to attach an implement and having somebody right between the rear wheel and the implement. And unfortunately, I couldn't find any uh, stock photos of somebody in that position. I should have made a point to get myself out there and just to illustrate the point. But I think you can all appreciate what I'm talking about, where you'll be backing up to attach an implement with a three-point hitch. And maybe you have your child or a spouse or one of your workers right there behind the rear wheel in front of the implement, right in the line of, of, of a potential accident should anything slip. If your foot slips off the clutch or you accidentally rev the throttle instead of bring it down and suddenly the tractor is coming back at full force. So these, these quick attach hitches make hitching up to implements much simpler uh, for anybody who's um, having real difficulty with attaching three-point hitch implements or works alone a lot and is really tentative, this is a device that can make life quite a bit easier and is probably well worth the investment. Um, I was uh, just at teaching in the Hudson Valley last week at the Farm Hub in the Glenwood Center, and I was uh, uh, interested to hear from Jean-Paul Cortens of Roxbury Farm, now the associate director at, um, at the Farm Hub of Hudson Valley that he really believes strongly in these, that he's actually put everything in, on his farm on, these, on this quick attach system because of the, the safety factor. It just makes everything so much safer as well as faster. With hydraulic lift implements, whenever you're working around a front end loader or anything that's held up by the three-point hitch, it's really important to chalk it. If it's going to be in the up position, um, for any length of time, moments really, you need to have it supported because the hydraulics could give out at any time and that front end loader or that implement on the three-point hitch could come down on you quickly. Um, the picture in the lower right where the two guys are working on what looks to be either a rototiller or a flail mower. It's a little hard to tell from this picture. I didn't take this as a stock. 
Um, you know, I see a bunch of issues here. They're wearing shorts, no steel toe boots, no gloves. Um, I don't see any evidence that that implement is chalked from underneath, supported by some kind of device to hold it up. Um, this is an accident waiting to happen. How are we doing on time? Any questions out there from anybody? Uh, we also do work with chainsaws, a lot of us on our farms, whether we're doing firewood or, or just clearing uh, around the farm. Uh, I do a lot of chainsaw work. I've trained a lot of people on chainsaws. Again, in the line of safety, I really believe that I, you know, chaps every time. There's not even a question about it. Chaps go on, steel toe boots are on, gloves are on, helmet with face shield and hearing protection is on. It's a checklist. Um, I also wear safety glasses during all my work. Um, because there's just so many things that can hit you in the face, in the eye, uh, or a moving chain, of course, coming down on your leg at 68 miles per hour, your leg doesn't have a, have a chance. Um, so we need to be mindful of this. And, and the other point with all of this stuff that I'm, I'm demonstrating in these slides is that, of course, there are costs involved for getting this personal protective equipment. You have to spend money on chaps and helmets. And if you have multiple workers who's going to be working with the equipment, that means multiple pairs of these. And as a matter of uh, raising the bar of professionalism in our work, this is something we have to budget into our annual budgets personal protective equipment. If we haven't done it, we need to start, and we just need to expect that that's part of the cost of doing business in our chosen work. I mentioned earlier NICAM, which stands for the New York Center for Agricultural Medicine and Health. They're based near Cooperstown, New York. They have an amazing uh, resource site that's well worth checking out. Um, as I mentioned, they have a catalog uh, of all kinds of personal protective equipment at reduced rates from what you would pay through other sources. Um, they have an incredible information center online. And at least in New York State, and I, I don't know about other states, but they will come to your farm for free in New York State to do an on-farm safety survey. Now, it's funded through New York State taxpayers, so I don't know if that transfers to Vermont or Massachusetts or other states in New England. Um, but NICAM is also affiliated with the Northeast Center for Occupational Health and Safety. And through that, there may be similar free on-farm safety surveys available in your respective state. So I encourage you to follow up on that and find out and, and consider having one of these safety surveys taken on your farm. They're very instructive and thorough and will help you see pitfalls that you may not have considered um, on your farm in regards to safety. It's an excellent resource. I highly encourage everybody to check out their website. This is uh, the three-point contact rule, or as some people call it, the three-point rule. And what this is is a, a, a manner to prevent falls around equipment. One of the biggest injury um, incidents working with equipment is that we have to climb up onto things like tractors or combines or even some of our wagons. And the point is here is that there should always be three points of your body in contact with a solid point when you either climb up or climb down from something. You should be facing in toward the machine, um, only climbing and, and climbing down, climbing up, climbing down when the equipment is off, the tractor's off. Um, and as you read down, you can see all of these important issues uh, that you need to consider getting up and down off of equipment. And in fact, any, anybody will tell you who's worked on tractors for a long time and has to get up and down off the tractor frequently during the course of the day, it gets tiring. And there is this um, sometimes instinct to just jump off. Uh, I see Hisa, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, uh, Isa, Hisa has suggested that Vermont has Project WorkSafe. Um, and they can provide technical assistance on OSHA regulations. So for those of you in Vermont, thank you, Isa. That's a really good uh, point. And just to illustrate what the three-point contact or the 3PC rule uh, looks like, here I am uh, mounting my tractor. You'll see that both my left hand and right hand have a firm grip on points of the tractor. My right foot is up on the footstep. 
as I come up my, uh, with my left foot, my right foot is still planted on the footstep. I've moved my left hand onto the steering wheel, and my right hand stays firm on the handle grip over the fender. So I do this in instinctively. It's just how I've always gotten on and off equipment. It should feel natural to most of you, but that's definitely something to think about. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you'll see I'm wearing all kinds of protective gear here. I've got on gloves. I'm wearing hearing protection. I've got my steel toe boots on. I've got my cell phone in a holster and my knife in a holster on my belt. My shirt is tucked in, by the way. You don't want any loose hanging uh, clothing around uh, machinery when you're working with it. That's something that can catch. These are all things we need to be aware of and to model to our workers, our trainees, our apprentices on the farm, and that we should just make part of our daily routines as we work with equipment. And I love this rule. If it feels unsafe, it probably is. The longer you work with equipment, and I know some of you in New England are working on really hilly ground on slopes. Uh, if you work with a front end loader, moving heavy objects on slopes or inclines, you know what I'm talking about. There are times when you can just feel that the tractor is, is, is going to move out on you. It's going to slip. It's going to roll. It's going to do something. And at that moment, if you're feeling that it seems unsafe, you're right. It is. Trust your gut. Get yourself out of that situation as quickly as possible so you can avoid a mishap. And ideally, if you're going to have one, it's not um, anything worse than this, which is you're still upright uh, if, if you should fall, as this probably was. Now, I don't know how this picture was taken. I didn't take it. If it just stopped at this position or if it continued to roll, that would be serious. Um, one of the handouts I pass to all of the people who take my tractor operation maintenance and safety classes is a, uh, an item Kubota put together many years ago called the Ten Commandments of Tractor Safety. Um, what I've done here is, is uh, cut and pasted those into this slideshow and included some photographs uh, to illustrate the point. But the first is know your tractor, know its implements and how they work. And you really need to take time to read that operator's manual so you understand how it's meant to be used correctly. And they also make the point, keep your equipment in good condition. I'm a strong believer in maintaining everything well. It's not just for longevity, but a properly maintained uh, piece of equipment is going to be a safer piece of equipment. And when you start doing maintenance, on your equipment and you're doing it regularly and you develop a familiarity with that equipment, almost an intimacy if you will, you will start to recognize things that may be warning signs of potential um, hazards. So taking the time to get to know your tractor, everything that you use with that tractor and understanding it makes you a better operator but it also makes you a better teacher when you have to go and teach your trainees, workers, apprentices, whatever, how to use the equipment you want them to use. RTFM, you know we have so many alphabet soup uh, letters in our vocabulary with farming but this is one of my favorites. Read the friendly manual, that's being polite for the webinars. Um, I, you know, I tell people, pull them out once a year, at least flip through them. You should be doing that anyway if you're doing your annual maintenance. You're going to want to look through, see what the specs are, making sure you're getting the proper amount of fluids, the right filters. So that's a good time when you're doing that to take the manual out and just read through it because we forget things. There may be some key little point we've forgotten about our tractors. And it's generally speaking somewhere in that manual. Now some of these, depending on which make and model you have, I've read a lot of tractor manuals. Some of them are poorly written. They're printed in China. There may be some typos. There may be some uh, photo captions that are incorrect. The other issue you run into, I have to warn you, as much as I like to tell people to read their manuals, occasionally you'll get some bad information that the specs on something like the uh, oil capacity will be off by a quart and you'll actually overfill. And the only way you're going to know this, of course, is by doing it and having the experience checking your work and finding out that something was wrong. And of course, whenever that happens with me, I make notes in my manual that, hey, next time I go to do this, it's probably five quarts instead of six. And I'd rather add five and have to add than add six and have to take out. 
and start all over again. All of this information is in your manual. Also, in the very first few pages of most newer manuals written over the last 15 to 20 years are a whole series of pages on safety protocols for your equipment. Many of those are reiterated with decals on the fenders of the tractor itself. So these are all things you should become familiar with. Part of what I'm trying to do in this lecture today, in this webinar series in general, is to increase appreciation and to foster awareness and to inform and acquaint all of you with the issues around tractors and machinery. Many of you are just getting started out with this, and there's no way in three short webinars that we can actually assure any level of competency once you've taken all of these. It's really an introduction to all of the concepts. I'm trying to foster awareness and increase your appreciation of all the complexities and challenges involved with these great tools that make our, our work more productive and ideally easier, but it has to be safe as well. So as I said, a well-maintained tractor is safer to operate. Uh, down in the lower uh, right, I'm changing the oil on a tractor. You can see I'm wearing nitrile gloves. Um, you want to protect yourself. The only thing wrong with this picture that I can see is I probably should have had cardboard under that oil pan. I try to do that, have something under it to uh, keep anything from spilling onto the ground itself that we're working with. Any questions at this point? Everybody seems to be following along, I presume. I'm not seeing any showing up in the chat box. Oh, wait. Uh, can you describe? I can't see. I'm missing a word there. Why, why you find why, a Sharpie? Why I find the Sharpie to be necessary to carry with you? Well, if I could uh, scroll up in that lower um, right-hand picture just a bit on that tractor. I write things down on my tractors in Sharpie ink and on my machinery. So for example, for those drain plugs, which are probably 19 millimeter uh, socket size, I would write that right there on the uh, edge of the um, oil pan. I would put oil pan drain plug 19 millimeters. So the next time I go to do the job, it's there. <laughs> Somebody's writing in the background. Um, on the oil filters, when I change oil, I write the the date and the hours on the tractor. Um, I do the same on any other filters I change where I can. Um, I'll write the PSI on the rim of the tire so I don't have to go back to the manual and look it up every time. The other thing I like to do is on machinery that has a lot of grease fittings, like say a manure spreader or a hay baler, I would write somewhere very prominent um, on this machine, 20 grease fittings. And then I would go around and actually write or make an arrow pointing to them. Because on our farm, we were always trying to train our apprentices, increase their awareness about what we do as the work of farming. And so if I said to somebody, I want you to go out and uh, grease the manure spreader, they can go out there, and it's written very clearly, 12 grease fittings on this implement. So they know they have to look for 12. And then what I've done is I, with my Sharpie, I've taken and made an arrow pointing in the direction of every single grease fitting. Um, I don't want to assume that somebody who's fairly new to this work is going to know where to look or even what to look for. So having a Sharpie just allows me to write on things. Um, if, unfortunately, if this is true for you, for example, your um, gear shift lever numbers have worn off from years of use with your palm on the gear shift lever. That would be a great time to pull the Sharpie out and write what the pattern is on the lever. Or maybe you write it right on the uh, over the uh, console or the uh, instrument panel of your tractor. Because you may know what it is, but you can't assume that a novice worker on your farm who you, you have put up on that tractor will know whether or not the high-low range is correct or in the right orientation. If they don't have something there to show them because it's worn off, how will they know? And I'm speaking from experience. I was once put on a tractor. It was an old Bolaris, a Russian-made tractor from the 1980s, where there was no uh, clear indication of what the high-low range was and what the, the actual gear I was in. It used a dial instead of a, a lever that you shift into position. You use this dial that you had to turn. And so I ended up doing a job in a very high gear that was completely inappropriate. Had that farmer taken time to just pull out a Sharpie and mark on it the correct gear positions uh, for each uh, point on the dial, I would have been uh, much more adept at doing the work. So I use Sharpies for all, all kinds of things. Um, so yeah, good question. I hope that helped answer it. My point, again, is if you're working with other people, 
trainees who aren't used to looking for these things, having that stuff there just makes it a lot easier for them to um, look at what it is they're supposed to be paying attention to. And that's really something I'm trying to do. It's just in line with increasing appreciation, fostering awareness. I hope that addressed your question, Ryan. OK, number two. Um, using the ROPS and seatbelt whenever applicable. Folks, if you have a ROPS and you don't have your seatbelt on, it's not going to protect you in a fall. And you just need to get into the habit of all the time, every time. And speaking from experience, I know that's a challenge. When I was farming in my younger years, I'd have uh, tractors that I worked on on somebody's farm that had a ROPS but no seatbelt. They just took them off. Oh, Beth, thank you for asking what does ROPS stand for. ROPS stands for Rollover Protective Structure. In some cases, they use the word system for the letter S. So it's either Rollover Protective Structure or Rollover Protective System. On some tractors, they can be folded down, as you see in the lower right-hand picture. That allows you to get under uh, low hanging or low overhangs. Maybe uh, your barn door doesn't clear eight feet. You know, you need something that can get under six feet. So you can pivot the ROPS down. Um, maybe you're going under uh, trees on the edge of a field that you're mowing in that first loop. Maybe you need the ROPS down. You do need to understand that when the ROPS is in the down position, you need to be unclicked from your seatbelt. Okay? The ROPS is designed to protect you in a turnover or a rollover. And the way it's designed to work, it's assuming you have your seatbelt clicked so that you are secure to the seat. And if the tractor rolls over, the roll bar, that rollover protective structure, is going to prevent you from injuring your head. It's designed to prevent primarily traumatic brain injury or head injury. Um, it may prevent other injuries as well. But assuming you're strapped in, then that's how that will protect you. Um, if you're not strapped in, you're going to fall out of the seat. And you still are at great risk for serious injury. The other question that just came up is, can you get rebates? Yes, you can. And you can go to NICAM to learn more about that. Um, you should know about ROPS that uh, earlier models prior to even as recent as 1980 were not always made with ROPS. And of course, many of you know this from seeing older tractors. ROPS started to be uh, applied to the construction of tractors in the mid-60s. And um, if you have a tractor made before that time, it's not likely that a ROPS can actually be um, applied to it. So if you have an old Ford 8N or an old Farmall Cub or anything like that that's pre-1965 or even 1970, you're probably out of luck. They can't retrofit a ROPS that's engineered to um, both withstand the impact of a rollover and that can be integrated into the existing frame of the tractor. From somewhere in the mid-60s on, uh, tractor companies started making ROPS optional in the beginning. It was a, an option you could pay for. So the frames were designed to accommodate a ROPS. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a tractor from that era that doesn't have a ROPS, you can go to NICAM. They may be able to help you out. They have a, a rebate program or a, a cost share program where they'll pay up to six or $700 of getting a ROPS put on. I don't know about other uh, manufacturers, but I, knew, I do know that if you have an older Kubota that uh, has no ROPS, that Kubota offers a cost share. If you bring your 1975 Kubota model tractor to a Kubota dealer, you can apply and obtain, I think it's again around $600 or $700 of a cost share for the installation of a new ROPS. So check with the, the maker of your tractor to see if they have similar programs. This is one of the most key uh, and important safe features that you can get on a tractor. And really, as, a, as an instructor of, of safety, I cannot encourage or um, advocate that anybody get a tractor without a ROPS and a functioning seatbelt. And I really want to encourage you, if you have trainees on your farm, workers on your farm, you need to model this every single time you get on that tractor. And it took me a long time to get in the habit, but I really believe strongly in this. It's one of our only protective um, elements on a very dangerous machine. Thanks for the points, Beth, in the background there. 
Okay, so here's an example. Um, many of us who work vegetables, we all know the offset cultivating tractor, the Farmall Cub, and its various um, incarnations after uh, the original made in the 30s and 40s. A um, little cultivating tractor, gasoline engine. You'll see here, obviously, there's no ROPS. There's no way to install a ROPS on this tractor. Um, there's no seatbelt, of course, because it doesn't have a ROPS. Um, the other issue with this tractor is that it's got a very high center of gravity. And I've heard of three or four people tell me of accidents they've had where the tractor completely rolled over backward, similar to what you see in the lower right-hand picture in the slide. I wasn't able to, I, I, I've never actually seen a picture of a cub uh, rolled over. But what I know of is people will be backing up to attach to an implement or something like that and uh, perhaps driving at too fast a speed. And those rear wheels will hit something, and the tractor just goes right over. Um, these are not a safe tractor um, for a lot of reasons. Um, they do have modern versions of these that were made in the 1980s. Uh, a number of manufacturers, Ford, John Deere, Kubota, um, I'm forgetting one right off the top here, um, all made offset cultivating tractors in the 80s. And they made them with rollover protective structures. So if you can find one of those, they are out there, um, much safer for your vegetable operation. OK, number three, be familiar with the terrain that you're working on and um, know of obstacles that are in the way. If you're working on slopes, uh, it changes the center of gravity on the tractor. Again, this goes back to that quote earlier, that rule, if it feels unsafe, it probably is. Um, those of you who have worked on slopes or rocky terrain, you know that you can come up on a point where suddenly you just feel that the tractor is going to flip, roll over. Um, you want to know what you're dealing with before you go out there. Um, you know, the prescribed rule is to move up and down slopes, not across. Um, you also will benefit, although not fully, if you have a four-wheel drive tractor and the four-wheel drive is engaged, that means those front wheels actually have traction and it can help improve your stability on slopes. Um, that said, that picture on the right where it shows two guys looking at the bottom of a tractor that's overturned, it looks like it's a John Deere based on the color. Um, I can tell by looking at those treaded front wheels that that indeed is a four-wheel drive tractor. Whether or not the four-wheel was engaged during the work, it's hard to say. But something caused that tractor to roll over. That's not a staged thing. You can actually see the damage on the, uh, the canopy of the rollover. Um, so these are things you have to be aware of. You need to know your terrain. Tractor accidents happen in, in a split second. So the thing is, it's not just a high center of gravity. You've got incredibly high torque to these very large rear wheels, very different from how a car is manufactured, where the front and the rear wheels are the same size. And it's designed to go over you know, paved roads at very high speeds. Tractors aren't designed to do that. They're designed to pull and transfer power. They're designed to operate in really difficult ground conditions and provide tremendous pulling power. So the physics are entirely different on a tractor. Um, these uh, number of slides from a Penn State publication, the link is there in the slide, um, show how different um, configurations of, of how your tractor might be on the ground can create hazardous situations. I like the two uh, pictures in the right of the slide that show a tractor with a cab trying to pull a stump. And the top one shows the proper hitch on the drawbar, which is a low point on the tractor. It gives you a much better uh, pulling point, a safer pulling point, whereas the second one, the lower one, shows that the chain is attached to a higher point on the tractor. That's very unsafe. You've changed the physics all together. And if that stump isn't budging, it's going to pull the tractor over. Um, so there is a point of no return, as that lower left slide shows, where you get up to a certain point, you aren't coming back down. It's going over. And if you have no ROPS and you're not buckled in, it's not going to be a pretty end result. So the, the issue here, or the takeaway here, is that um, understanding the physics, tractors have a very different design. It's almost inherently unsafe, unfortunately. Um, and so we need to be aware of that every time we're on these machines and understand what it means to be safe on them, that we're doing the work, that we're, we're on the tractor properly, that we're, we're being safe in every aspect of what we do with it. Of course, you don't want to start your tractor indoors with nothing open, no windows or doors open. Um, 
Ryan, I'm sorry, I, I see a question just came up in the chat box. I'm going to slip back a slide. Ryan asks, can I explain the Ray center of gravity, normal center of gravity on the top left picture of the previous slide? Um, yeah, I think, Ryan, I, I'm not that familiar with this book, but um, what that's illustrating is that the low point on the tractor, In uh, if you look on the left of the photograph, we're talking about the top left photograph in the slide. If you look at the tractor illustration to the left of that image, you see that the normal center of gravity is just below the bottom of the um, rear axle. Um, and that uh, a higher raised center of gravity, which is closer to where your butt would be sitting, is, is quite high up on the tractor. When you shift the wheels, all of that changes. The relationship changes. And now um, your points of uh, reference are quite off balance from what it was when it was stable on the ground, meaning it's much more dangerous in terms of uh, falling over because gravity is going to pull anything over eventually that's not stable. Um, I don't know if I've actually explained that clearly enough. Um, so if you go to the link, hopefully it will give a more thorough explanation of what we're trying to show here. So I think, I think uh, yeah, I could so jump. anyway. Could I just jump in? We'll I think go it back has to, to the slide. Sure. So I, I think it has to do with um, the first one in the, the picture on the left. Everything's in a direct line, and it's within the wheels. But when you go to the one on the right, the raised center of gravity it starts to move outside the wheel, which is pulling the tractor off of its base, is what's happening. Yeah, uh, good. Thank you. That's a very good clarification. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name right, Isa or Hisa. Do tractor manufacturers typically suggest in their manuals what slopes are safe to work on? Uh, generally, there will be some illustrations, but that's up to the maker and manufacturer. You won't find that in every manual. Um, typically, you want to go up and down slopes. You, If you're um, going up a real steep slope, you'll actually be advised to back up the slope instead of driving straight up. Um, you try to avoid going crossways across steep slopes. Um, much of this will be in manuals, uh, but not all manuals. It really is going to depend on the, the maker of the tractor. That's a good question, though. I know that's an issue in Vermont and other parts of New England. So obviously, uh, commandment number four, open the door before you fire up the machine. You don't want that exhaust uh, to be trapped. So uh, commandment number five, keep your power takeoff properly shielded. Um, when you're working around power takeoffs, you never want to go between the tractor and the implement. If it's turning, um, that turning power takeoff is the cause of many serious accidents for people around tractors. So in this slide, let me see if I can get the um, pointer to work here. Um, so I'm going to bring it over. Can is it showing? I don't think the pointer is showing. I'm not I'm seeing still, it. Uh, I'm supposed to hold on it, hold down. It's not dragging. I don't know why. Um, if you look to the, uh, sorry about this, folks. I'm having a little technical glitch here. Uh, the lower part of the photograph in the center shows where the power takeoff is attached to the tractor. You'll see a shield uh, part of the tractor that's actually over where the PTO connects to the tractor. And you'll see a black plastic shield over the actual metal parts of the moving power takeoff. That's all designed to protect you, and those shields should always be in place when you're using your equipment. This is a power takeoff driveline off of an implement, uh, you'll see that there are two chains, one uh, on each end of the power takeoff drive line. Um, these chains are designed to be attached to a fixed point, one on the implement, one on the tractor, to keep the plastic guards in place. Um, there's also a safety decal on the shaft explaining how it can be very dangerous, so you can get twisted around it if these are removed. Unfortunately, though, when you go to buy an implement, 
um, and you get a, a power takeoff shaft delivered with the implement or if you have to buy one, sometimes they don't come with the chains. Now in this photograph here, if you look to the, the, the forefront of the photograph, the yellow implement, that's a flail mower on a three-point hitch, you'll see kind of to the lower left, there is a chain wrapped around part of the three-point hitch frame that goes to that turning power takeoff shaft uh, shield. But if you go towards the, if you follow the power takeoff drive line up to the tractor in the center of the photograph, it's missing a chain on the front. There should be a chain up there as well that could be actually secured through the shield of the uh, power takeoff shield on the tractor. And that would secure everything to prevent um, that from slipping or sliding off. Here's a photograph of two different tractors, both missing the shields over the power takeoff drive line on the tractor. Um, let's see here. So keep pitches low, always on the drawbar. This goes back to that center of gravity uh, question from a few slides back. If you have, um, I, I see a question just came up from Ryan. I'll go. I'll get to it in just a moment, Ryan. Um, if you have a chain attached to the back of the tractor, maybe you've put it up to the top link point, or maybe you've got your lower links lifted high and you've got a crossbar, as I'm showing in this slide here. Sometimes uh, you can mount a drawbar between the lower links. The problem with this is that it's not stable. Um, this can actually rise up and down and throw the balance of the load that's being hauled by the tractor. Um, in both of these instances, you get a very unsafe situation where whatever you're pulling can throw the balance, can throw the center of gravity, and cause a rollover. So you would think, looking at this photograph, if this is an accurate depiction, and I think it is because you can actually see the disturbed soil under the rear wheel that's in the forefront of the picture where they probably dug in a little bit. That little small tree gave this tractor fits. This is probably about a 35 horsepower Massey Ferguson from the 1950s. Clearly no rollover protective structure. Um, and you know we don't know what happened to the, the operator of this tractor. Um, let's hope that they didn't get injured. But even a small tree like that has enough uh, power if it's rooted well into the ground that that tractor is not going to pull it forward. It's going to pull the tractor back on you. So a safer way to have done this would to have been to have that chain attached low to the drawbar as we talked about earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to flip back here a few slides. Um, for Ryan has a question about. Um, excuse me a moment. I have to cough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Ryan, the plastic shield that you see around the shaft in the center of this photograph, and I'm going to go back one more, those shields can be added on to an old power takeoff shaft. So if uh, I go back to your question here, Yes, you can buy these, and in fact, I believe you can buy them through NICAM that I referenced earlier. I think they have a program where they can make these shields available at a lower cost than if you went to some place like Tractor Supply to buy them. I hope that answers your question. And I see there's a question from Josh. Uh, Josh asked, did I hear you say earlier that the four-wheel drive tractors are less likely to flip over via that back wheel pivot point? Um, no, that's not how I was uh, meaning to word that. If I, if I confused you, I'm sorry. I'll go back a couple of slides here. Um, a four-wheel drive tractor like the John Deere that's shown turned over in the right of the slide on this slide, um, that's a four-wheel drive tractor. It has treaded front tires. Generally, if the four-wheel drive is engaged, Josh, it means that you now have four wheels that are actually engaged to the ground in a traction mode. Whereas if you have non-four-wheel drive <coughs> or the front tires are not engaged, excuse me, I, I need a sip of water. <coughs> um, if, if the front wheels are not engaged, it creates a situation where those wheels are just rolling over the ground. And um, <clears throat> especially on a slope, it's a lot less safe. So I wasn't referencing 
um, a back wheel pivot point so much. It's just that the front wheels, if engaged, provide more traction to hold the tractor to the ground more readily than their non-engaged or non-four-wheel drive counterparts. I hope that clarifies. OK, moving forward, um, slipping through these slides here. So again, pulling with a drawbar in the uh, left-hand photograph, again, neither of these tractors have ROPs, so I wouldn't encourage this. But you do see in the left-hand photograph of the Massey Ferguson, I believe that's a Massey Ferguson, trying to pull this stump that they've got the chain attached to the drawbar, which is the lowest point on the tractor. That's what it's designed to do. On the right-hand side, uh, the photograph of that old tractor trying to pull this log, from what I can see in that picture, it's got a drawbar uh, drawn across the two lower links, which I just described as being inherently unsafe. That can travel up and down, meaning it's not fixed, it's not rigid. And it looks like, from what I can see in this photograph, that they actually wedged a plastic fuel can in there, maybe trying to give it some weight. But that's not going to be nearly enough to give it the kind of stability it needs to keep that from moving up and down. Again, what I'm talking about moving up and down is this type of a, a drawbar attachment. Those two lower links can actually, um, there's, there's not enough downward pressure on them to keep them from traveling upwards if the load shifts or if the terrain shifts. So that creates an inherently unstable situation that you'd want to avoid. And standing on it isn't going to do it. Um, somebody asked here, uh, is the board on the stump in the left-hand pick to keep the chain from sliding up or down? Um, I did not take this picture, so I can't answer definitively. I would presume it's to create a secure point for the chain. But I, I can't say for certain, so I don't want to make that assumption. Sorry, I can't answer that more precisely for you. Uh, commandment number seven, you never get off a moving tractor, leave it with its engine running. Um, tractors can run away. Um, there are a number of stories of people starting tractors from the ground thinking it was in neutral when in fact it was in gear. And then they go forward and either uh, run over the person who started it. Um, or that end through the back door of the shop or the back wall of the shop. Um, you, you know, there are times when you are going to leave a tractor running that uh, there are implements, for example, that you would use with the tractor in a stationary position but the motor running and the power takeoff running. For example, a chipper shredder or an irrigation pump or a uh, silage um, loader into a silo. All of those require the tractor to be a stationary power source. So the tractor would be parked in neutral and running at full engine speed for the power takeoff, which would be high RPMs. And of course, when you do that, it's very important to have all the shifting, uh, the gear shift levers in neutral. If you have a range shift and a gear shift, it's important that they be in neutral your rain shift might actually have a park position, so you would make sure it's in park. Um, the brakes need to be locked and set. And you might even chalk the wheels um, to, to make sure the tractor is as secure as possible. Um, but this is a really important point, um, that tractors can run away from you. Uh, when refueling, allow the engine to cool down. Um, I don't like the image in the slide on the left where it shows somebody actually standing on a piece of equipment while it allows them to be up higher, which makes fueling easier because you have to hold that five-gallon diesel fuel tank, which can be heavy and hard to lift high. Um, he's also standing on a, looks like the platform of a brush hog with more than a few obstacles that he could trip over. And not only that, but there's a lot of uh, loose grass or straw there on the deck, probably grass of some sort. He's been mowing. Um, that would be something that you could slip on. You've only got two points of contact, the two feet, because both hands are holding the fuel can. So this isn't a very safe situation depicted in this photograph. Um, and that's a challenge. Fueling can be really difficult. Most of us do not have a situation like the photograph in the right where we have a dedicated fuel tank and, and fuel lines 
that we or fuel hoses that we can hold like we do at a gas station. Most of us are relying on five gallon cans to fill the fuel um, on our tractors and that's always a challenging proposition, especially if you're a shorter person or a smaller person and you don't have the muscle strength to hold up a, a filled five gallon can to a high point to fuel up a tractor. That's a, an inherently de bad design feature that we need to address in the future. And of course, coolant, uh, I, I advocate people checking their coolant levels every day before they start to make sure it's at an adequate um, level to cool the tractor engine down, but you only want to do that when the engine is cool. You should never open a uh, radiator cap when the engine's hot, that's under pressure, and it will blow, and it can scald you. Uh, commandment number nine, it's uh, important to keep children off the tractor. Um, children, kids, they love to play on tractors. Uh, I mean, the, the slide on the left is almost iconic. It's very common to see kids get up on tractors. Um, this illustrates a serious uh, falling hazard. Either one of them getting on or off could fall, hit their heads. Um, same on the image on the right. Um, although I did see in a larger blown up version of the image on the left, that the girl in the picture was actually wearing a seatbelt. Some tractors have, with a cab, have an operator seat and a passenger seat next to it with a seatbelt. Um, now this is probably just a posed picture, but it's one of the few I could find an image for of children on machinery. The other thing that happens, and this is uh, uh, it almost sounds silly, but it's true, uh, and I know it's true because I've had it happen to me, where we've had kids around that get up on tractors and they start playing with levers and dials on the on the tractor, that's what kids like to do. They like levers, they like dials that they can turn. And what they'll do is they'll actually um, change the position of things that were left there intentionally. So maybe you left everything in neutral, the next time you come up to the tractor, um, you find that something's in gear when you go to start it that you didn't remember leaving it as such. Um, I had a nephew climb up on my tractor and because of the way the four-wheel drive engage lever is, he actually stepped on it. It's, it's below where your lower, uh, your left foot would um, rest on the tractor and as he climbed up onto the tractor, he actually stepped down on that lever with his foot. And the next time I went to use the tractor, which involved driving it down the road a little bit, I realized it was in four-wheel drive, which I typically would not have in that situation. Um, and this is, you know, they might turn on your headlight switch, for example, and wear down the battery. These are all things I've seen happen with kids playing around tractors. There's also a lot of steel edges that they could uh, hurt themselves with. So as interesting as it is for kids and, you know, we want to have them on our laps driving down the road, I hate it whenever I see that. It's just inherently unsafe. Having kids riding on the fender is a terrible idea. Um, there's just too many um, potential accidents and of course if you start looking at the accident statistics and you want to go Google this stuff and read about it, you're going to find many um, instances of children falling off and being killed or badly injured. So the best policy is just not let them get up there in the first place. And then don't be in a hurry. Um, that's hard to tell people, I know, because we're always under the gun. We're always trying to do much, uh, do more than we can in the available daylight. We're fighting weather. Um, and so we're always rushing through our work. And yet, if we just slow down a little bit, we'd probably be a lot more safe when we're working around our, our equipment. So it's safety first. Take your time. Do it right. And I think um, in this, I think this is my last slide for the day. Work smart. Stay safe. You know, I wish people using round bales would really get a three-point hitch device for carrying their round bales. Even if they're going to do one with a bale spear off the front end loader, by having a bale on the rear as well, you've got a nice counterweight giving yourself a lot better stability. The image in the left-hand photograph showing the farmer moving a round bale in the little Kubota tractor, it's got a few good things that I like seeing in this picture. For one, he's got the loader at a good height. It's not too high that it's blocking his vision. It's not too low where it could potentially hit something that he can't see from the operator's seat. He's got a bale mounted on the three-point hitch instead of up front, giving him a better, um, your, your three-point hitch actually has a greater lift capacity than the front-end loader does. Everything about this suggests safe, oper safe operation. 
whereas the image in the lower right, um, boy, that does not look safe at all. You're going up a slope. You've got your loader all the way up. You're trying to carry two bales, and I don't see any evidence of a counterweight there. This was actually a photograph taken in the UK and used to demonstrate how they were um, creating a situation, a legal situation that would um, make this not possible in the future. I didn't get all the details on that, but um, not a good idea what you see in the lower right-hand side here. So I think I've covered all the major points I wanted to make, and we still have time on the clock. Are there any questions from anybody about anything that we talked about today? Nathan asks, would a counterweight on the lower right be even more unsafe for falling backwards in that situation? That's a good point, Nathan. Um, I think if the counterweight were low on the hitch and that load was lower to the ground, the whole situation would be a lot safer. The issue there is you've got those bales so high that you run the risk of um, either if, if they go up much higher going over and backwards um, or the weight could actually pull the whole thing down um, forward. It's unsafe in many ways right there. Also, Nathan and others, I just saw on my way home from Vermont on Saturday, I was up teaching at the Intervale on Saturday, uh, Friday, I was driving home on Saturday, and I didn't have time to stop and take a photograph, but it was up in the hills of Vermont, south of Bristol, I saw a farmer driving a fairly new Kubota tractor, carrying a bale on the front of his tractor, and he had the loader right up high in his, his line of view, so he wouldn't actually see clearly anything coming at him. It was way too high, and he had no counterweight on, nor did he have his flashers on, which if you're driving on a road by law, you're supposed to have a slow-moving vehicle triangle and your flashers on. None of that was being done. It would have made a great photograph had I had time to stop and capture it. Um, but uh, you want a counterweight when you're working with round bales or any heavy object on the front end loader. And um, I've told many people, if you're moving bales, round bales, you know, and you're using a bale spike, get a three-point hitch spike as well. You'll be able to move two bales at once, and you'll have your counterweight at the back. So that's a good point, Nathan. Any other questions before we wrap up? OK. Um, did I just miss something that came through? Ryan asks, um, I thought okay. it to happen um, to leave the yes, diesel tractor running and putting the parking brake on when I dismount for short periods of time. Am I hearing from you that we should turn off the tractor even for short periods of dismounting? Uh, good question, Ryan. Um, <clears throat> well, there's the ideal and then there's the reality, right? Am I going to say I never leave my tractor running when I get off it for a few moments to check something or do something? I'd be lying if I said I did every single time. I don't. I do leave it running sometimes. Um, I always want to make sure that the brake is set, that it's in neutral, and that any implements are down to the ground. So the front end loader is down, which acts as a um, kind of a chalk for the tractor to, to help stop it. And my rear implement is down as well. That's the thing, Ryan. You raise a really good point that all of the safety instructions tell us never step off a tractor that's left running. The reality of the work is, is that it sometimes forces us to. Um, and of course, if you're doing work where the tractor is a stationary power transfer uh, unit, like running a chipper shredder or a log splitter or um, anything running off the PTO that's stationary an irrigation pump, the tractor has to be running to operate whatever it is we're doing. Um, and also, I understand, and I, I think this may be part of your point, Ryan, that with a diesel engine in particular, it's more efficient just to leave the engine running than to start it and stop it frequently. So yes, there's the ideal, and then there's the reality. I think, Ryan, the takeaway is that probably the ideal is going to be really hard to achieve every single time. That said, if we're mindful and aware of what we're doing when we do get off that tractor that we're leaving running, the onus is on us to make sure that we have put it in neutral or park if there's a park set on the range shift lever, that we've set the brakes, that we've lowered the implements to the ground, and that really there's nothing around that the tractor could um, damage or harm should it take off on you. 
So for example, there's no kids in the area, there's no livestock in the area or pets. Um, you might even want to look at it and imagine if this were to lurch forward or in reverse, what would it hit? Um, so Ryan, I appreciate what you're saying and I know it's a challenge. Um, I think too, I have to say I'm not affiliated with a tractor uh, safety training program per se like the one at Penn State. Um, I'd be curious to hear how they would answer that type of question. Um, having heard similar things before, they would probably say shut it off. But you and I know the reality is, is that that's not always possible. Sometimes we're actually trying to check something and we need it running. So um, yeah, that's a tough one. Ensure that everything is safe when you get off. If any of you are familiar with the uh, State Farm insurance commercials where they feature Aaron Rodgers, the Green Bay Packers quarterback, saying discount double check, I came up with my own little slogan, the dismount double check. In other words, if I'm going to get off the tractor, that is dismount the tractor, I'm going to do a double check, if not a triple check, and make sure that all those levers are in their proper position. So Ryan, next time you get to jump off that tractor with the engine running, do a dismount double check and make sure that everything indeed is set in the proper position. I hope that answers your point, your question. Uh, any other questions from anybody? Well, there was, there's one about counterweight, um, but, Beth, I see. but I also wanted to ask what if you have the, like, the PTO running? Would, would that change your, your Well, as I suggested, if you're, yeah, obviously, if you're running a log splitter um, or um, I, was thinking, I run a chipper shredder where, wh what were like you thinking? Like if you're mowing of? and you, you know, you're mowing and you stop and, you know, you have a brush hog. Uh, and you need to check something, to, for example. Yeah, like I guess what I'm thinking is you turn off the the PTO. You're not going to be walking around that implement in the back. Yeah, that's a good point. So maybe I, I just overlooked that in, in in imagining the situation Ryan was discussing. But yeah, if you're going to get off a tractor and you're running an implement. So let's say you're mowing. That's a good example, Beth. You're mowing with a brush hog or a flail mower, and you come to a point where you just need to you need to pee. So you stop the tractor and you get off. If I'm going to get off and I'm not going to shut the tractor off and leave it running, and I've got an implement running off the back, the first thing I'm going to do after I brought the throttle down and stopped the tractor from rolling, putting it in neutral, I'm going to shut the PTO off. So unless I'm running an implement that demands that I have PTO power to do the work, i.e. a chipper shredder, um, if, I'm, if I'm doing something else like brush hogging or uh, rototilling or something like that, and I'm going to stop and get off the tractor for a minute, I'm going to shut off the PTO. That's going to be part of what I do. Um, let's see. And thanks, Beth. Find out what the Penn State people would say. I, I will. I'll, I'll find <laughs> it out. I'll put it on the website. Um, because, you know, that, that question comes up all the time in my classes and all I can answer is we all know what the books say, the manuals say, shut off the tractor. But the reality is many of us won't or don't just because it's not practical. We're trying to do work or, you know, there's also just the reality that with diesel engines, it's, it's actually you're using more fuel just firing it, starting it, than you are if you just leave it running. I think the important point to take away is know the dangers, be aware of the dangers, and do that dismount double check. Are there any other questions? Uh, the counterweight question, is there, um, are there formulas? Um, Did I miss uh, that? Nathan asked whether... Oh, sorry, Nathan. I'm looking at the question now. Are there proper counterweight formulas and manuals for tractors? Um, Sort of. Now, you'll see sometimes that you can have ballast put in the wheels, a liquid solution put in the wheels to offer um, some something of a counterweight on the rear. Um, and um, sorry about that ringing phone in the background. <laughs> it's State Farm. They're calling to tell me that I can't use dismount double check in my lectures. <laughs> Um, I'm serious, it's actually State Farm calling, I don't know what they're calling about. Um, anyway, yeah, the, the manuals will explain ballast in the rear wheels and that will help you better understand that. 
Um, I haven't seen an actual formula ever um, that said, you know, if you're carrying a thousand pounds in your front end loader, you should have at least 500 pounds on the back with ballast in your tires as well to counter the load on the front. Um, that's a good question. Uh, there's actually something now available where you can buy, it's essentially um, a three-point hitch framed device that allows you to put front end weights on this frame on the three-point hitch, which is desirable because it's a counterweight, but it's also really close into the back of the tractor at a low center of gravity. Um, and there's a name for that, and I'm sorry, I'll try and find it and send a link to Beth to put up on the website. Um, again, this may be a good question for the people at Penn State, Beth. Do they have any formulas for that? I'd like to know. Oh, we'll do. So we're about, good question. We're about seven minutes. Any others? We're about seven minutes over, and I can see that some people are needing to leave um, to carry on with their day. Um, if there are any, um, I think we'll wrap up the formal part of the um, webinar now, but if people have um, additional questions, it sounds like you might have a few more minutes to spend with folks. Yeah, I'm happy to stay on the line. Justin has a question. Um, Justin writes, I have lots of old equipment and implements. How can I tell they are still safe? Okay, good question. I mean, first thing is, do your tractors have a ROPS with a seat belt? Um, that's very evident just by looking at it. Do your power takeoff drive lines have shields on them? That's another one. Um, but Justin, I don't know where you came into the um, the dialogue, but uh, it looks like you were here early on. Um, I don't know where you are, Justin. Can you tell me which state you're writing from? Are you in Vermont, Massachusetts, New York? You're in Vermont. Somebody mentioned earlier in the chat box about a Vermont program. I think it was. Um, uh, I'm not going to get her name right. Hisa uh, made a uh, point about Vermont having a um, a program affiliated with OSHA. Um, I'm scrolling back down in the chat box to see if I can find that. Um, do you remember that? I can, I can get it. Yep, I can go grab it. Oh. Yeah, I think I would look for that if I were you, uh, Justin. And here it is. It's called Project WorkSafe. It's possible, I don't know what Project WorkSafe offers, I'm not familiar with the program, but I would contact them and see if they could come and do an on-farm safety survey similar to what NICAM does. Um, if not them, check the NICAM website. The, uh, there was a link in the slides. And um, they're affiliated with the Northeast Center for ag safety, and somebody through there may be able to help you uh, do an on-farm safety assessment. OK, good luck. I hope that um, will help you with that. Yeah, we've just got a link put up there in the, uh, thank you. He said, I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly. Um, ho hopefully that, I I'll check that out too, and we'll see if there's anything good there. OK, and there's some other stuff coming in. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Isa. OK, any other questions? I'm, uh, I'm happy to stay on the line for a few minutes if anybody wants to know uh, anything more or if I can answer anybody else's concerns or questions. I'm going to pause for just a couple of minutes. And if not, we'll probably say goodbye. So I'm just going to. And thank you all for participating today. Thank you very much, Shane. Great presentation. Getting... I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you. Very good.